I want to talk about what it is to be blessed this morning. I wanted to talk to you about something that, that is, is thrown around in Christian circles, the word blessed. Right? In, in Greece, there's an island called Cyprus. And it's supposed to be this amazing island. So I went online and I'm like, I want to find Cyprus. What does it look like? I've been to some tropical things. I've, been, I've had the fortunate ability to dive in the West Indies. I went to Hawaii and I've been to the Caymans and, and been to some, some islands in the Caribbean. And they're, they're all gorgeous. And like I've never sat on an island of, of, of Cyprus. I go, what does that look like? And so I pulled up a picture in the middle of that rainstorm. How many people got snow? We shouldn't have to be dealing with that. And I was like, what is the deal with this weather? I was in Denver in a meeting and came back and hit Longmont. It's like this blizzard of 2017. Like, this is stupid. I, I text my brother who lives in Huntington Beach. I'm like, hey, dude, what is it? Oh, it's like 85. And so I took like a screenshot. Like, this is what I'm dealing with. Click. And he texts back. <laughs> stupid cop. And so... We have to edit that out because someone will be like, look, Dave Souther is anti-cop. Like, no, my, my brother's just a stupid cop. And, and um, I text, I, had a, I have a cousin in Rhode Island, and he's like back and forth. Like, how is it there? 95. Having a heat wave. Like, not us. We're making snowman on Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever it happened. And so when I pulled up the thing, it's like, I, I, the Greeks called Cyprus, and it's gorgeous, man. Blue water. It's just an amazing island. Like, I could be happy there. Especially when it's snowing. It's like, you put me on Cyprus, I'm not going to be happy. And I found out that the Greeks called that the Isle of Happiness. And the reason the Greeks called Cyprus the Isle of Happiness is because to them, it had everything a person could need. It had great geography. It had the ability to grow things. It had, it had great sea life. So it was like, I'm happy. And the word that they use is makarios, makarios, M-A-K-A-R-I-S, makarios. And that word is the same word that is translated in scripture as blessed. Right, well, that's kind of interesting. Now, to the Greeks, blessed, a person was blessed if you were one of three things. Right, if you were a god, little g god, not a big g god, so like if you were Zeus or some other Greek god, you were happy because you didn't have to deal with all the human stuff and human frailty, that you lived above the earth. And so you were makarios, you were happy. The Greeks also said that if you were happy if you were rich and wealthy. Like, I like this, guys. Because you could live above everything and you could buy your way out of stuff. And so you had everything that you needed so you were happy. And the third way a Greek could be happy was if you were dead. Like seriously. So when you did the research on the thing, it was like, you're a god, little g god. You know, thunderbolts and all that stuff. If you were rich or if you were dead. All the rest of us are kind of jacked. Like, well, that, that's not fair. But when I thought about that, it's really, you know, it's a lot about our society and our culture right now because a lot of us think, and even myself, how many of us have thought, oh, my God, I would be so happy if I had more money? Constantly. I mean, to be honest, it was like money doesn't make you happy. Well, it makes life a little bit easier. I mean, if we're going to be honest, it's like if you've been poor and had no discretionary income and then you got a raise and you had discretionary income, I'd be honest with you, I was more happy over here. When I was unemployed and, and went through that thing with my business and went like, hey, honey, we might lose everything. But we may, when that compared to, hey, sweetie, we're making a lot of money. You want to go to Europe this month? A little more fun. A little more happy. All right, so there's, there's truth in that to a point. 
But we have also discovered, man, how many people have known rich people, people that are like sitting fat, big houses that are miserable? Like, dude, what is wrong with you? You're like rich. And you're like miserable. Oh. Or, so, so, so this idea of being happy, this idea of being blessed in the American culture is a little bit whacked. Just a little bit. Like a lot of bit, but because we're politically correct here at 23. We can be, but if we were, we would say that, that American culture is sort of tied up into things. And, and we, we talk about being happy with stuff, and yet when you read Scripture, being happy, being blessed is something different. It's something more profound. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 4, 23 through 25. It says, and he, Jesus, went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So when you're healing disease and affliction, what does that mean for the people that you're hanging with? That they're sick, right? So, okay, so keep that in your head. And so his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, all those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and healed them. Does that sound like a happy crowd to you? Now, to me, and great crowds followed him from Galilee to the Decapolis and from Jerusalem to Judea and from beyond the Jordan. It did not seem to me that if, you, if we, we take that snapshot of that people and how the author describes that, that we would apply the term happy or blessed or makarios to any group of those people. They were following Jesus for something. And it says that they were demon-possessed and they were sick and they had all sorts of afflictions. They were broke people. They were just trying to get by and they're following Jesus looking for something. And the reason we're, we're, I, I want to frame this is because this is the group of people that Jesus was speaking to when he began the Sermon on the Mount. Now, for if you've sat in church at all times, this, this is a section of Scripture that is probably the hinge point of Orthodox Christianity. The Sermon on the Mount. Blessed is. That word blessed that we're going to look at, he starts off by saying this. He says, and then Jesus turned to his disciples. So if you picture this massive humanity, the massive humanity follows him, and is looking for him, and he's healing everybody, and they seem kind of destitute and down on their luck. And he says, turns to his disciples and said, Blesses you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. If you're circling your Bible, I was, oh, I, I, I've never... Stop long enough to look at this. But I was intrigued by the word now. Blessed are you who are hungry now. Blessed are you who weep now. He goes on in verse 22. Blessed are you when people hate you. And when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on the account of the Son of Man. God blesses you. Happy is the man. Is how it actually translates. Happy is a man who is poor who is hungry, and who weeps. Happy is now. How does that work out for us? If we were going to be honest with us, if you are weeping and you are poor and you are hungry, how can you be blessed? How can you and I be blessed when we're miserable? I mean, because if you're, if, you're, if you're crying, you had your heart broke. You've been let down. If you're hungry, you don't have the basic sustenance of life. You can't put food on the table. If you're poor, no matter how hard you try to work, you just can't get caught up. The phone still rings. Been there? You take two jobs and that stupid bill collector still calls you, for 
the thing that's now three months due, and you get that pleasant thing like, okay, where is it? I'm going to come pick it up. Or when the entire housing market collapsed and you bought houses at this level and you found out that it's worth that. And what was it? 20 some odd percent unemployment. No matter what you tried to do, you couldn't find work because there wasn't any work. Blessed are the poor. Happy is the poor person. Like, it didn't make any sense to me. And then I was out walking my dog around a park. And I listened to a guy named T.D. Jakes. I love that guy. So I was listening to him in my, in my little earbuds on my phone, yelling at my dog. And he said this. Maybe he didn't say that. Blessing is not a condition. It is a position. Blessing is not a condition. It is a position. And I stopped when I heard that. You see, I live in the same world you do. I live in a world that tells me that if I get more stuff and I like stuff, <clears throat> ain't nothing nicer than skiing in new boots. Except my wife hates her boots. The smell of a new car. Right? Going out and looking at houses that are, that are updated. Like stuff. And we're told in our lives that if you have stuff, be happy. But that's conditional. Some of you know what my wife and I are fighting and, 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 and what my wife is going through with, with, with this sickness. And I guess conditional. Took the dog around the park this morning and went, hey, you got to help me out here, man, because I don't get this one. I ain't happy about this, God. And yet I kept coming back to that, and I think that is the hinge point of the entire Sermon on the Mount, and I would go so far as to say it's a hinge point on all of our faith. That happy is the man. Whose condition doesn't matter. Whose position is secure. That means that you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, as professors of faith in Jesus Christ, are blessed. No matter what we bring to the table, no matter what sits on our back, no matter what we've gone through, no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what we face today, you and I are blessed. Happy is the man. How many people struggle with that? But if you think about it, This is what we know. We are blessed because we are chosen. As sons and daughters of God, that means the, the author and finisher of your faith. That means Jesus who was before all things. That means God the Father who created everything. That there was nothing that was made apart from him. He looked out before the foundations of the earth, however that mystery works out, and goes, I want you. And I want you. And I choose you. And I choose you. That you are chosen. And I am blessed. That we are blessed. That we are happy. Because no matter what I face today, no matter what you bring today, you are chosen by God himself to be a son and a daughter, that you guys, not the holy dude that sits on the TV, not the person that you listen to on, on, on your, your, your earbuds, nothing like that. That means you guys. That you have infinite value by, in God. That you are blessed. Ephesians tells us that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. 
In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons, and you can put hashtag daughters, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, which He has blessed us. And the beloved. Some of you come and look at your family like, man, my family's messed up. Man, I mean, I mean, there's no, there's no bragging about your mom and dad or your brothers and sisters. You can brag about this one. Because your dad in heaven, by whom you can say, Dad, Pops, Abba Father. Loves you enough to look out to you. He's like, man, I love you. You are so special. I pick you. I don't pick the person just to the next to you because they live this way or that way. I chose you. And you, we are blessed because of that. We are blessed also because if this works, oh, come on. Oh, there we go. You ever walk around life guilt-ridden, filled with shame? just horribly tore up by what you did do that you knew you shouldn't have done. Shame and guilt's a funky thing, man. That thing, it's like wearing a millstone around your neck. You just walk around and you are just constantly weighted down in shame. I would go so far as to say, even if you don't know Jesus, well, you know, Christianity adds guilt. No, Christianity doesn't add guilt. Life and stupid choices add guilt. Right, so we're like, well, Christianity, if I were just Christianity, you know, just a, a series of, of uptight rules and regulations. No, Christianity is life. Life is difficult, and life offers stupid choices that burden us. And it is hard to be blessed when you are burdened. Like, I am free. You're not free. You got that thing around your neck. You walk around like this all day long. Lift up your head. I can't. I'm filled with guilt. God comes along through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. And if we repent, we are forgiven. We as sons and daughters who He chose, who He chose, just go to Him. Man, I am sorry. And the blood that was shed on Calvary cleanses us as white as snow. And so removes our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. Oh, we are blessed. We are blessed because we, we have friends that are like all uptight. And, and man, you just watch them and they just live with regret. But if you know our Savior, if you experience life by Jesus, then it's like, oh man, I used to be there. That stinks, man. But as sons and daughters, ah, to be forgiven. Right? And then we are blessed because we have an inheritance. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14, it says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to praise of his glory in him. You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Until we require we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Anybody ever put a personal guarantee on a loan? Ah, uh, not too many parents. Most parents at one time or another is like, "Hey, I have no credit. Can you personally guarantee this?" Okay. And what a personal guarantee means is if you don't, right? If the person that you dearly love doesn't pay the note back, guess who gets to? Personal guarantee. Because you know the bank loves you enough to call you just like he loves, calls your whoever you guaranteed for. The debt rolls downhill. Debt never goes away. Scripture tells us that as sons and daughters of the Most High who have been forgiven are also promised an inheritance guaranteed by the third person of the Trinity. Like, well, that doesn't apply to me. Well, then you question 
the, the, what would it be? The consistency of the character of the Holy Spirit? We are blessed because no matter what we don't have right now, we are promised it in eternity. And if I was going to stretch this life out, like we wrap ourselves so much in life, like this life consumes us. And it consumes me. But if we were going to put a dot, little dot on a string that stretched from the west coast to the east coast, that is the substance of our lives here on earth. And the scope that we have to spend with God is our inheritance. Inheritance that is given and offered by God himself. The guy that made everything. Who has, what, cattle on a thousand hills? We're set. At the end of the day, we're set. We are so, so, so blessed. Happy is the man. Happy is the woman who knows Jesus. Who knows Jesus. But I know people, hypothetically, that don't seem happy. Even people that know Jesus. I'm miserable, folks. It's sad. Hey, why are you so miserable? I'm gonna, someday I'm going to preach an entire series on the gospel according to Eeyore. <laughs> anybody, anybody, everybody know Eeyore? Oh. You lose your happiness. You lose blessed by your religiosity. And this is in the Sermon on the Mount. So, so see, Jesus stands before all these people. And he says, blessed are you who poor, are mourned. Blessed are you who are poor. Blessed are you who weep. Blessed are you who are persecuted. And then he goes on and he talks about some stuff. And I think he talks about some stuff because he sees these men and these women who should be happy, have the potential to be blessed, refuse to be blessed. And so he, he says this in, in Matthew 6, 16. It says, when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. So he's talking to Pharisees. Religiosity is not relationship. You are blessed when you have a relationship with God. You are not blessed when you follow a bunch of rules and regulations trying to justify the relationship that is freely given. You, we lose our way when we figure we've got to be something that we are not. And we become hyper-religious and we fast and we pray, not because we want to enter into relationship with the eternal, but because someone on the left or the right is looking at us and so we better raise our hands a little bit more. We better hold our heads up high. We better be able to quote scripture. And we sure had better dress right or look right or act right. God is not interested in that. God is interested in your heart. Blessed is the man who enters into relationship with him. Not in the one that says, hey, look at me, ain't I? I'm like almost floating, I'm so holy. <laughs> you ever know a religious person to be happy? Man, I know a lot of uptight religious people that are miserable. 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 Four syllable word. I don't know many religious people that are happy. Just another one. He goes on, he says, and says in verse 19, chapter 6, don't store, your, store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break and steal. For wherever your heart is, wherever your treasure is, there, there the desires of your heart will also be. We've talked about this. We know people, everybody in this room knows people that has a ton of stuff and hate life. And like we're looking out going, man, God, my car has 180,000 miles on it. Let it drive. Oh, praise God, got to work and back. And they're driving like a brand new Mercedes and they're all shiny and it's all blingy and leathery and they live in a 5,000 foot house and they're going on all sorts of vacations and they have six figures in the bank and they're talking to you about their 401k that set them up for life 
and you just celebrated, hey, we hit five grand in our retirement fund. And they're like, they're, they're, they're miserable. And, and they brag about their stuff. And then when you talk about their stuff, they're like, hey, man, I didn't want, man, I'm not about that. Oh, they, yeah, that's all you talk about. You've got a safe full of stuff and you're miserable. Explain that to me. Because where my heart is, where my treasure is, there's my heart. God blesses us with things. I fully believe that. God blesses us at times in our lives with jobs that not only pay the bills, but allow us a a, a modicum of success. God gives us things that we can be successful in, and God gives us and blesses us with material blessings. He does those things for us. I believe that. I am not an adversary with money. I think God blesses us financially so that we can bless others. And the church and the kingdom of God needs affluent people to further God's kingdom. And we don't have to be uh, upset because we drive a nice car, live in a nice house, or be able to go on vacation. I am not saying that. But what I am saying is if you think your happiness is rooted in that, you're lost. Because as quick as that stuff is gained, it's just as quick as it's lost. Man, trust the brother up here who put seven years of business and got to tag it for an auction and went home the same day after being seven years of living fat. Just living fat and happy. Driving a new truck every two years and going, hey, we need this. Yeah, I guess we do. And traveling all over the world, coming home from an overseas thing and tagging everything that I made for seven years. You realize at that point in time what you work for here can go poof, the blink of an eye. God is not punishing this, but God tells us in his word that that, that, that treasure is going to rust and our moth eats it. Man, enjoy it. Be blessed by it. I love to pour out my blessing on you. But don't, don't stand on that stuff. It's going to go away. And then what do you have? Here's another one, worry. Verse 6, 34. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. How many know that? Oh, buddy. How many people have spent the night staring at the ceiling? Doesn't that stink? And you're like, we're, you're, if you're like me, like here, and then God bless your spouse. Like, you okay? Yeah. It's 2 o'clock in the morning, and the ceiling hasn't moved. You can't go to sleep? No. And you you do that day in and day out for unfortunately weeks on end because you're consumed by the what ifs. How many people know that you can never fix a what if? You can plan for all the what ifs in the world and they're still going to stink when they happen. When we worry about everything, And I'm struggling with this right now. Worry. Oh, God. I hate worry. I'm good at it. But what does it add? Sufficient is the day. And finally, 7, 1, and 2. And honestly, you guys, I've read this chapter, and I never looked at it this way, but I was really curious by going... Man, you're telling us we can be happy in the midst of misery. But then you address some pretty substantial things that steal it. It says in verse 7 and 1 and 2, and this is all in the same historical context. This is still Jesus talking to his disciples. Right? So he's talked about religiosity. Hey, don't pray out loud like you got all your stuff together. Don't collect stuff because it's going to disappear. Worry doesn't fix anything. And he says, finally, judge not that you would not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So we've talked about religious Christians. You ever see a judgmental Christian happy? They're the same miserable people. They wear the same shirt. They're God's policemen. They go around and enforce all the rules and regulations that God himself could do if he wanted to. 
And then they tell everybody how short everybody else is. And really, you judge someone not to encourage them to bring a life of repentance. You judge someone so that you yourselves are lifted up. Because if I can make you miserable and I can tell you how bad you are and I can see your sin, I really don't have to look at my own. In the same section of Scripture, he says, hey, don't worry so much about the speck in your brother's eye when you get a log jammed in yours. Judgmentalism takes a lot of effort for very little results. We are not, nor will we ever be invited to be the Holy Spirit. We just don't have the capacity or the qualifications to fill the role of God in someone else's life, no matter how smart we are. We can pray for someone, but that's not judging someone. We can speak truth into something, but truth is always spoken of in grace because that's how God himself brings it. We live in fear of this world, as do I. I see where the world's going. I see where our government's going. I see where our politics are going. I see all that stuff. I read too much. I am consumed at times by the state of the world. And I so want to scream at some of my brothers on one side of the aisle or the other side of the aisle. And I want to judge them as lacking because on both sides they lack. But at the end of the day, where does it get us? I have men and women that I dearly love. I watch them, and I see them make stupid choice after stupid choice, and I want to go, hey, idiot. That's like the perfect word. And yet, where does it get us? We are called to be representatives of Jesus, and Jesus is filled with grace and mercy, and no, I don't say sin so that grace may be abound more. I'm just saying judgmental spirits. It doesn't bring any fruit. And it makes us more miserable than the people that we, we jab at. Let me end with this. You and I, as sons and daughters of the Most High, are blessed. Are blessed. Are happy. It doesn't matter what we bring to table today because what we bring today doesn't affect our position today. What we face today, no matter the disease that we face, no matter the trials that we face, no matter the jobs that we face, no matter the uncertain future that we have, no matter the uneasiness that we feel, we are still chosen by God. Whether we come short in our bank account, we can't make all the bills we're still as sons and daughters. No matter what we think about our mistakes and our shortcomings and the sin in our lives that so easily entangles us, the blood that was poured out on Calvary cleanses us when we ask for forgiveness. Oh, we're blessed. And no matter where we live, no matter if we're one step away from a car, no matter if we lose our, 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 the stuff that we worked for, no matter if we are on unemployment, no matter if we can't secure a job, no matter if we don't know anything, we have an inheritance. We are blessed. Don't walk around miserable because you're blessed. Don't walk around timid because you're blessed. Don't walk around like you're embarrassed of your faith because you're blessed. Oh, and share that with other people. Because this world needs some good news.